I just want to take a moment for those who don't know me at all. I'm a Jewish believer in Jesus. God saved me in 1971 as a heroin shooting LSD using hippie rock drummer. I was 16 years old, I went to a, my first church service to pull my best friends out. And uh, over those months afterwards, God began to deal with me, convict me of my sin, open my eyes to the gospel. And then I was radically saved at the end of 1971. Uh, when I first came to a service at a church, one of the young ladies knew me in high school, and she wrote down in her diary, Antichrist comes to church. <laughs> I mean, I, I was a wicked, sinful rebel. The drugs were just a manifestation of other wickedness in my life. And uh, what happened subsequently, though, was, uh, you know, I got saved. My life radically changed. Two and a half years later, met my wife, Nancy, also Jewish. She was a hardcore atheist when we met. God saved her, brought us together, and we're celebrating 39 years of marriage next month. Amen. So, so sometime after we were saved, I found an old picture in my drug days and long hair, and, and she started laughing. I said, you're laughing because I look like a woman. She said, no, I'm laughing because you look like an ugly woman. <laughs> if, if you don't believe that... Um, Years ago, I wrote my testimony out in a tract and, and called it from LSD to PhD. And if you get online and just put in my name, Michael Brown, LSD to PhD, you'll find, you'll find some of those old pictures before I was saved. And you, you will agree with her assessment. All right, listen, when I'm done with this talk, before we break, I'll tell you how you can connect with us on internet. We have thousands of hours, literally thousands of hours of free resources online. I do a live radio show two hours a day in different cities across America. It's not on live here right now, but you can listen live online. You can subscribe by podcast or catch broadcasts after the fact. That's two hours a day. Uh, we post lots of new videos on YouTube. I normally write three or four, sometimes five new articles a week. Uh, you may see something happening in the news. You're disturbed about it. I'll either be talking about it on radio or writing about it the next day. So my radio show, I'm introduced as your voice of moral, cultural, and spiritual revolution. And that's really what we seek to do on a daily basis. All right, the question of homosexuality in the Bible. Can you be gay and Christian? A pastor recently said to me, my generation, meaning people older like me, when we hear the word homosexuality, we think of an issue. When a young person hears the word homosexuality, they think of a person. And, and this is both an issue in society and in Scripture, as well as a person. And what I'm saying tonight, I want to say with as much grace and truth as possible. I want to speak with accuracy, with clarity, and with a heart overflowing with love. Someone that I don't know was attacking my position on Twitter, on the Internet the other day. And I normally don't have time to engage everyone, but I decided to engage this person who wanted to know why I was attacking gays and judging gays, and Jesus said not to judge. I said to him, well, aren't you judging me? Seems like you're judging me right now. I said, but when I give the good news of Jesus, how am I attacking gays? And he responds, well, the two main things stopping gays from coming to God are Satan and people like you. Why was he so upset? Why was he so angry? Why is this so volatile? On the one hand, some of you say, Where, there's no issue. The Bible's black and white on it. It's just the compromise of the society. It's things getting darker around us. Why is there even any question? And others are saying, how could you be so bigoted and small-minded with your old interpretations of the Bible and not looking at the evidence of, of people who love God and are practicing homosexual men and women? Because we are dealing with people as well as with an important cultural and theological issue, we need to be as careful as we possibly can. And, and here's the danger. The emotional issues can be very powerful. The emotional arguments can be very powerful. Are we going to tell an 18-year-old kid that we're witnessing to that says, well, I'm gay, and what does Jesus have for me? And we talk about forgiveness of sins and new life. And then that person says, well, I have to be celibate the rest of my life? I tried to change. I can change. I have friends that tried to change. Are you telling me I never marry? I've got to be celibate the rest of my life to follow Jesus? 
How is that good news or the gospel to that person? It's a powerful emotional argument. Maybe some of the nicest people you know identify as gay and lesbian. They're not marching down the street in some vulgar parade. They, they want to live a committed life. They want to raise a family together. Who are we to tell them it's wrong? On the other hand, God's word doesn't change based on what's in and out in society. God's word doesn't change based on the latest trends. God does not care about polls and popular opinion. And every one of us who claims to be a follower of Jesus, here's where we have to start. Doesn't matter what your background is, doesn't matter what denomination you come from, doesn't matter the color of your skin, your ethnicity, doesn't matter how you identify in terms of sexual orientation. The only question is, God, what is right in your sight? How can I live a life pleasing to you? What do you require of me? We're going to look at a lot of scripture and, and we'll be as clear and, and outlined as we can. But let me say fundamentally what I have seen as a fatal flaw in the theology of those who say you can practice homosexuality and follow Jesus at the same time. I've read their stories. I've wept over their stories. I've sat and talked face to face with tears reaching out in love. I've agonized over these things. I don't take them lightly. But this is what I've seen consistently as a testimony, that someone will say, I've studied the Bible, and you know, there are lots of different interpretations about the Bible, and I'm really not sure what it says, but I do know that I'm gay. And what they end up doing is interpreting the Bible through the lens of their sexuality rather than interpreting their sexuality through the lens of the Bible. Where we need to start is, God, your word is truth. Your word is without flaw. Your word is perfect in every way. Open our hearts and minds to receive your truth. And then whatever you say, we will joyfully follow you, knowing that your ways are best. Go with me to Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4. This verse does not deal directly with the issue of homosexuality. And again, the question we're asking has to do with homosexual practice, homosexual relationships, as opposed to having an attraction or a desire in itself. And we'll come to that in a moment. Hebrews 4, verse 12 says this, For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart, Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Notice that it says it divides to the very separation of soul and spirit. Here, speaking of soul, would be speaking about our, our emotions, our mind, our, our, our thoughts, and spirit, our innermost being. And, and many times our thoughts can be deceptive. Many times emotions can be deceptive and fleeting. You, you might be watching some old classic movie, some tearjerker, and you're sitting there crying. Wait, wait, it's just a movie. It's just actors and actresses, and you know that, but it's got the music playing and the whole atmosphere. You turn the music off, suddenly the spell is broken. The Word of God has the power to break the spell of emotions and culture over our lives and to get us thinking clearly. I had a pastor on my radio show last year, a Methodist pastor named Frank Schaefer. Not Frankie Schaefer, the son of the famous Francis Schaefer, but Frank Schaefer, a Methodist pastor. He had been defrocked by the Methodist church because he performed the same-sex, quote, wedding for his son and his son's partner. And he was a very nice man, a caring man, and was shocked that the church would discipline him for doing what he thought was a loving, gracious thing to do. The church has since reinstated him. And he said that he was questioning some Bible teaching before his son came out as gay, but once his son came out as gay, he had to reevaluate what the Bible said, and then he felt that walking in love required him to bless his son and that his son wanted to be in a loving relationship with another man, and therefore he should bless it. I asked him, what if your son came to you and said, Dad, I made a terrible mistake. 
I've been under deep conviction by the Holy Spirit. I know I did the wrong thing, and God does not want me in this relationship. I said, would that cause you to have to restudy the issue again? He said, absolutely, of course it would. That said everything right there. Jesus warned about it in Matthew 10, 37. Whoever loves father or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever loves son or, or, or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Father and mother, son and daughter, if they love them more than me, they're not worthy of me. Jesus is saying that our first loyalty must be absolutely to him, and out of that, we can truly love others the way God intends us to. So we need the word of God to pierce through any confusion that we have, and it also says nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. The word of God reveals who we are to the very depth of our being. My scholarly training is in Bible and ancient languages. My PhD from New York University is in Near Eastern languages and literatures, so Hebrew and, and the ancient Semitic languages and the literature of that day. So it's a field I still work in. I have a commentary written on Jeremiah. I'm finishing a commentary on Job now. I can tell you, as one who does this academically, and I'm a, an adjunct professor at four different seminaries, I can tell you that there is no new data that has been discovered that changes what we always thought the Bible was saying about this. No new texts have been discovered. No new manuscripts of the Bible have been discovered that change this. There is no new linguistic data, no new archaeological data. In other words, the reason that people are questioning what the Bible says is not because the Bible is unclear and not because there's new information, rather because of what we're experiencing in our society around us. That in itself should tell you, be careful. Do you remember what happened to Balaam in the book of Numbers? King Balak wanted to hire him out to curse Israel. He was a pagan prophet. And he sends word, well, I'll give you all this silver and gold. Come and curse Israel for me. And Balaam says, I have to ask God and see what he says. So God appears to him and says, don't go, don't curse them because they're blessed. That would be a threefold no, right? Don't go, don't curse them. They're blessed. He says, I can't do it. Sends them back. The king is upset. He sends the messengers back and says, I'll give you up to the half of my kingdom. Come and curse Israel. Balaam says, I can only do what God tells me to do. I'll ask again. Fatal error. If something's unclear in Scripture, and there are many verses we have to study and evaluate, you ask, you seek. If you're not clear about what the Lord is saying, you ask, you seek. But if God speaks plainly, lo tinoff in Hebrew, do not commit adultery, and now you're attracted to someone you're not married to, you don't go and ask God again. Lord, can I get a second opinion on this? Because she's really pretty. <laughs> Since the word of God itself is not ambiguous on this, it is the social pressure and the fact that, that we know people, very nice people, and people who seem to be very spiritual, often will say they love God, who identify as gay and lesbian, how do we sort that out? Let's understand the testimony of Scripture remains plain. The fact that many books are being written on this doesn't mean the Bible's not clear. The fact that there's been a spate of atheist writings in, in the last decade plus doesn't mean that God's existence is uncertain. First thing we need to understand is this. The Bible is a heterosexual book. What do I mean by that? I don't mean that God's word does not relate to every human being on the planet. It does. I don't mean that Jesus did not die on the cross for every human being. He did. He shed the same blood for every one of us, regardless of our background, regardless of our weakness, of our strength. He died for all of us 100%. What I mean is from beginning to end, the Bible speaks to heterosexual relationships and heterosexual marriage as the only thing that he has ordained. You see, people often say, if this is such a big issue, out of the tens of thousands of verses and words in the Bible, why are there only a handful that deal with homosexuality? They've got it completely opposite. The entire Bible is presupposing one way, one order, one 
method of relationships, and only here and there does it need to speak against the others. I'll give you an example that I got from my friend Larry Tomzak. You may have heard Larry's name recently because he had written a column, an article, and in the midst of it, he made passing reference to Ellen DeGeneres and gay activism, and somehow it came to her attention, so she talked about it on national TV. Talked about Larry. It took like four plus minutes. And then Anderson Cooper heard about that, and then he went after her, after Larry as well. And then I wrote a column addressing some of Anderson's objections in a friendly way. It was called Setting Anderson Cooper Straight, but it was, it was, a, it was done tongue-in-cheek the same way that he did his. But Larry gave a great illustration. Let's say that I write a cooking book. It's a cookbook of healthy recipes. Great recipes, sweet tasting desserts, but no sugar is ever used. And at the beginning of the book, I explain, I don't believe in using refined sugar in sugar products. I find them to be dangerous and unhealthy. And because of that, you will not find a single recipe with sugar anywhere whatsoever in this entire book. And you read through the rest of the book, and the word sugar doesn't occur once. So you check on your ebook, and you say, the word sugar only occurs five times in this recipe book. Obviously, it's not important to the author. No, the exact opposite. Because it's such an important issue, the entire book contains no sugar in the recipes. That's how you have to understand the Bible, which means that if you're two men, you're two women, and you say, we love each other, we love the Lord, the Bible is not speaking to you the way it's speaking to heterosexual couples. I'll explain. We start in Genesis chapter 1 at creation in verses 26 and 27. God creates Adam Mankind, humankind, in his own image, Zachar in the Kevav Ra'am, male and female, he created them. And then he says, be fruitful and multiply. So the only ones in his creation that can fulfill that, be fruitful and multiply, those are heterosexuals in terms of here's the creation, put us alone on an island, and we will multiply. Now, of course, homosexual theologians would say, yeah, yeah, but it's not detracting from you. There are enough people multiplying. We're not hurting anything by not being able to have kids of our own. I'm not talking about hurting anything. I'm talking about God's design. Now, we get to the second chapter, and it focuses in on Adam, Adam. It focuses in on him. And, and, and God says it's not good that he should be alone, right? Then what does it say? He needs a companion so he won't be lonely. No, it doesn't say that. He needs a suitable helper. It's not just God not wanting Adam to be lonely. It's that Adam needed a helper to fulfill his mission, a suitable helper. Was that because the garden was so big and it was too big for Adam to care for, so he needed a helper? No, it's so that he could be fruitful and multiply and that he would have a fit companion. So what happens? God takes out of his side or out of a rib, forms the woman, she's called Isha, woman, because she's taken out of the man, Ish, and then the two come together and become one. And, and Adam says in Genesis 2.24, therefore man will leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, and the two become one. You know, it's just like two plugs. There's the male and the female, and they're suited, and together there's a certain connection that is made so the male is made for the female, and the female is made for the male. Natural law, biological design, tells you what God designed us for. Here, if, if, if I try to flip the page with my elbow, it, it doesn't work well. Elbow wasn't made for, for that. If, if, if I say, hey, I can't see you, let me look. Well, I can't look through the ear. It wasn't made for that. Our bodies were made in a very strategic, specific way, and it's clear that the male was designed for the female and vice versa, that only we can be fruitful and multiply, and that it is the fact that we are same but different that we come together physically, emotionally, spiritually, and the two become one. All of you who've parented, it's not just a difference of, of some people have different perspectives, but men and women are built and wired differently. It's by God's design. Now, you start there in Genesis 2, 
and then the rest of the Bible, it always and only presupposes heterosexual relationships, just like the cookbook without sugar. Only healthy recipes, only heterosexual relationships. Every law about marriage, every law about parenting, every parable, every illustration, it is all heterosexual in nature. I'm not being nasty to someone who says they're gay or lesbian by saying this, but look, when you go to Ephesians 5, husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church, and then the responsibilities of the wives to the husbands. If, if you're reading that as a gay couple, who's the husband, who's the wife? I don't say that to mock. I'm saying it's not written for that. Honor your father and mother. Okay, you're raised by two men or by two women. Who's the father, who's the mother? It, it's, it's, in other words, it's not written with those in mind. Let's go further. Even the, the negative types of relationships, even the ones that are not ideal, like polygamy, which, which was acceptable and even legal in Old Testament times, but was not God's ideal from creation, e even that is always heterosexual. Every relationship that's spoken of, heterosexual in nature. There is not a single positive reference to a homosexual relationship Anywhere in the Bible, every relationship that God has ordained or blessed is heterosexual, and every reference to homosexual practice is negative in the strongest possible terms. That's not ambiguous. That's from beginning to end of Scripture. Someone might say, yeah, but you're forgetting something very major. But the Bible has been misused for centuries. The Bible was misused to sanction slavery and segregation and the oppression of women. That's true. It was. People say it's also being misused to sanction anti-homosexual prejudice. Now, if you're quoting Scripture to cover up hatred in your heart, you're misusing the Bible. If you're quoting Scripture to cover up bad attitudes in your own life, you're misusing the Bible. But... Here's where people are very wrong about this particular application here. Yes, the Bible was misused to sanction the African slave trade and all of its horrors. The fact is it was Christians using the Scripture, William Wilberforce and others here in America who used the Scripture and used the principles of the Scripture to overthrow and end the slave trade in the UK and in America. Also, slavery within Scripture was of an entirely different order than the, the murderous and barbarous African slave trade. You don't have time to get into that. If you've ever read through the laws of it and the customs involving it, you're talking about two completely different animals. And more importantly, the Bible's a book of liberation. The Israelites are liberated slaves. Jesus comes into the world to set the captives free. The Bible says in Jesus, there's no slave or free. It's a book of liberation. And within the Bible, it doesn't speak in praise of slavery. This was just something in the ancient social system, being like an indentured servant and paying off debt. That's for the most part why it existed. As for using the Bible to sanction segregation, I remind you there too. It was Christian leaders coming out of churches who led the way in the anti-segregation movement, and there's not a single syllable in, in the Bible supporting segregation. There is a call to separate ourselves to live holy lives and not to be like the world, but God forbid, there's not a single verse anywhere in the Bible that, that merits segregation and one race being superior to the other and therefore separate from them. As for using the Bible to oppress women, the fact is where the gospel goes in culture, women are liberated and raised up. In the ancient world, one of the great effects of the gospel going out was now there are requirements on men to be holy and not just women. There are requirements on men to be faithful to their wives and, and not just wives to be faithful to the husband. But not only so, within the Bible you have great leaders like Deborah. You have the mother of Jesus and other women playing esteemed roles in the New Testament. You, you have a whole section, a lengthy section in Proverbs 31, praising a godly wife. So to use the Bible to oppress women is a misuse of the Bible. To the contrary, to use the Bible to say that God ordained marriage to be the union of a man and a woman, 
to use the Bible to say that homosexual practice is sinful, to use the Bible to say that God did not design a man to be with another man or a woman to be with another woman, that is not to misuse the Bible, that is to properly use the Bible. And if we do it in the love of God with tears reaching out to all and offering them new life in Jesus, then we are rightly using the word of God. Amen. Generally speaking, when one of these conversations comes up about the Bible and homosexual practice, the Christians will immediately quote Leviticus 18.22 or maybe Leviticus 20.13, and they think that settles it. That's everything. That's the answer. After all, Leviticus 18.22 says it's an abomination, a Hebrew toevah, something detestable for man to lie with a man the way a man lies with a woman. And in Leviticus chapter 20, verse 13, it even carries the death penalty under ancient Israelite law. And for those who are only listening with, with half an ear, which is not virtually everyone here, but just in case someone's not listening, I am not advocating the death penalty for homosexual practice. <laughs> it was under Israelite law along with adultery, along with violation of the Sabbath, and a number of other things. But I'm simply quoting what Scripture said with regard to that in terms of how harshly it was penalized. Well, we'll quote that verse, and then generally speaking, someone will come back with the answer, well, do you eat shellfish? I know, I've never been a shellfish eater. And now with my mega healthy diet, I don't even eat wonton soup because that would have pork in it. But I don't eat any meat, hardly. But most of us, yeah, shellfish or, you know, pepperoni pizza or whatever. So the question would be, okay, how can you quote one verse in Leviticus and ignore the others? Leviticus 11 has all these food laws. That's many verses. Deuteronomy 14 repeats it. How can you ignore those? And you, and you break all kinds of laws in Leviticus. You're just being a hypocrite. Well, there's a simple answer for that. Unfortunately, many Christians don't know the simple answer. And they don't have an answer when someone confronts them with that. So what's the answer? Here's the short answer. God gave certain laws to Israel to keep them separate from the nations, like dietary laws and things like that. He gave other laws to Israel based on universal moral principles, like don't murder, okay? Well, how can you distinguish them? That's the big question. How can you distinguish what God gave to Israel to keep Israel separate from the nations? How can you distinguish that from a universal moral principle like don't murder? Well, two ways. One, does God speak this to all nations? Does God speak this to everybody? For example, murder is prohibited right after the flood in Genesis 9, 6. Whoever sheds man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. So murder is prohibited right from the outset, and then it's repeated through the rest of the Bible. It's repeated in the prophets. It's repeated in Psalms and Proverbs. It's repeated in the New Testament. It's for everybody. The dietary laws were given to Israel. They weren't for everybody. Did God ever judge pagan nations for murder and cruelty? Sure. Did God ever judge pagan nations for eating pork and shellfish? No, because that was only for Israel. What about Leviticus 18? Leviticus 18, which deals with various sexual sins, including incest and bestiality. Leviticus 18 is based on universal moral principles. These things are wrong for all people. How do I know it? The text says so, and it's repeated in the New Testament for all people. So it's not ambiguous. So let's take a look in Leviticus chapter 18. Only God knows people's hearts. So I can't be dogmatic about this, but I can tell you what folks have told me that sought to live the, quote, gay Christian life by, me, by which I mean practicing homosexuality and following Jesus at the same time. They've confirmed this. So if someone tells me it's not true in their own lives, that's between them and God. But my perspective would be this. The verses that speak against homosexual practice are so strong and so clear that 
if I was seeking to live that way, if, if that was who I was and I was same-sex attracted and I was in a relationship with someone and the whole of the Bible is speaking to heterosexuals about heterosexual relationships and when it does mention homosexual practice, it mentions it very negatively, that would be troubling to me. And I would have to really reinforce that. I'd have to reconvince myself. I'd have to have a, a lot of support and security around me to keep objections out because those objections would mess with me. One man who came out of homosexuality to find liberty in Jesus was asked the question, can you practice homosexuality and follow Jesus at the same time? His answer was, not for long. Again, that was his experience. It makes sense to me. So Leviticus 18.22, do not lie with a man as one lies with a woman. That is detestable. Well, gay activists would say, but look at the verse before. That's talking about idolatry. Do not give any of your children to be sacrificed to Molech, for you must not profane the name of your God. I am the Lord. And they say this was homosexual practice in conjunction with idolatry. Well, the next verse, do not have sexual relations with an animal and defile yourselves with it. Does that mean it's only wrong to have sexual relations with an animal in the context of idolatry? And is it suggestive that the two are in consecutive verses as things that are very wrong and contrary to what God intended? But now look at the end. Verse 24, do not defile yourselves in any of these ways because this is how the nations that I'm going to drive out before you became defiled. Even the land was defiled, so I punished it for its sin and the land vomited out its inhabitants, but you must keep my decrees and my laws, the native born and the aliens living among you not, uh, must not do any of these detestable things. For all these things were done by the people who lived in the land before you and the land became defiled and if you defile the land, it will vomit you out as it vomited out the nations that were before you. God judged the Canaanites for these sins. In other words, this is a universal moral prohibition. If it was wrong for the Canaanites, it's wrong for everybody. If God judged pagan idol worshipers for this, he will judge anyone, especially within the body, for this. Some have said, yeah, but the Hebrew word toeva, abomination, just means ritual defilement. It does not mean moral defilement. Well, it can be used either or, depending on the context. But God did not destroy the pagan nations based on ritual defilement. And he did not give the death penalty for ritual defilement. Therefore, this was a very serious issue in God's sight. Somehow, something that had a profound impact on society or was profoundly wrong in his sight. When you see the effects of gay activism on society and, and you see how it, the, the attack on marriage and the desire to transform marriage makes it basically meaningless. Right, right now in England, by law... The word husband can be used for a woman, and the word wife can be used for a man. Based on a bill going forward in California, if, if on a birth certificate, there are two lesbians on a birth certificate, one can be designated the mother, the other the father, vice versa for men. So you have male wives and female husbands, and male mothers and female fathers. Everything becomes meaningless in terms of words and terminology. This is what happens once you play with the foundations. This is what happens once you try to redefine the meaning of fundamental things like marriage. And I've also asked gay theologians, if you say Leviticus 18 does not apply to us today, then where is the prohibition for incest? On what biblical basis do we say that incest is forbidden? This may shock you, but I've documented in recent years the celebration of incest in the media. I've not seen the shows or the movies, but I read about them, get the transcripts, and, and document this. I was contacted a few months ago by a young lady. She said, we have a new website. It's uh, debate out or out debate, something like that. It's for young people. We're going to be talking about the cutting edge controversial issues and, and uh, We'd like you to participate in the debate. The way it works is we'll ask you a series of questions. You give us your answers, and then we publish your answers along with the answers of others and let people see the different perspectives. I said, sure thing. She said, well, the hot topic, she said, as you know, one of the big hot topics is consensual adult incest. Hot topic among young people. 
why should it be illegal for two grown family members, father and daughter, two brothers, two sisters, daughter and father, mother, whatever, why should that be illegal for them to have a consensual loving relationship? I said, I'm quite aware that it's a debate because I've been tracking these things. Well, I did the debate, submitted the questions. They contacted four other people, another professor, others. Out of the five, I was the only one who said it should be illegal. One of my points was, I quoted Chesterton, don't ever take a fence down until you know why it's been put up. You see, once you begin to yield in one area of redefining marriage and redefining relationships, how can you say no to the others? Look, the media's been celebrating homosexuality long enough. You know, Will and Grace is like old now. Queer Eye for the Straight Guy is old now. What's, what's the media been celebrating in recent years? Have you noticed? Again, I don't watch the shows, but I read about them. Big love. Sister wives, the most recent one, my five wives. Went from three wives to four wives to five wives. Polygamy. Why is there a surprise? If you want, quote, marriage equality for all, love is love. Our president, for whom we pray, two years ago when the Supreme Court overturned the Defense of Marriage Act, he tweeted out, love is love. Well, then why be discriminatory about any relationships of any kind? Once you get away from the foundations, you quickly go in this direction. There is an active battle against gender distinctions. There is a bill being submitted in Charlotte, North Carolina, where I presently live, that is arguing that for anti-discrimination, you cannot discriminate based on uh, uh, gender or gender identity or perceived gender identity. So they want to add gender identity and perceived gender identity, meaning that if I identified as a woman, that I believed I was a woman or perceived myself even on a given day as a woman, that I should be able to use the ladies' bathroom, any public facility, ladies' locker room. It's already law in different states for, for children in schools. It's law in California that if a child identifies, a boy identifies as a girl at six years old, he can use the girl's bathroom. If it bothers the other girls, that's their problem because you can't discriminate. If he's 17 years old and, and identifies as a girl and wants to play on the girl's uh, softball team, he can and use the girl's locker room. You said that'll never happen. It's already happened. Already happened last year. We had a student in our ministry school who was teaching at a local nursery. So she would work with the kids four years old, preschool. And she was not allowed to call them boys and girls because that would be making a gender distinction. She had to call them friends. She was required to read books like Heather Has Two Mommies, and she wouldn't. She ultimately had to leave the job. And that's some years old, that report. We don't mess with foundations like this without major, major implications. And, and because of the instant nature of our generation, and you get everything instantly, and, and I love, I mean, I publish something, I write something one night, it's published the next morning. I'm more urgent, I post it the same night. I get a thought in the middle of a service, tweet it out, and now it's getting tweeted all over the place. Unfortunately, we often lose our long-term vision because of that. And a lot of young people think like this, Billy's a really nice boy. He gets picked on all the time. Why shouldn't Billy be able to marry Bobby? And we don't look at the larger issues of society and family and marriage and what God intended. And the fact that when we say two men can raise kids or two women can raise kids, as devoted and loving as they may be, they may be the most devoted parents you'll ever meet, but they are guaranteeing that that kid is deprived of either a mom or dad by choice for life. And that cannot be fair or in the best interest of a child. Well, the objection is raised. If this is such a big deal, how come Jesus never addressed it? I was on Piers Morgan a little over a year ago and got asked that very question. And he challenged me, Dr. Brown, can you tell me one place, give me one verse where Jesus said anything about gay or being gay? So I said, all right, I'll give you three. Now, let me clarify first. The argument from silence is a dangerous argument. Where did Jesus specifically address wife beating? Maybe it's not a big issue because he didn't specifically address it. Maybe Jesus believed in alien invasions. 
If it's such a big deal, why didn't he say there's no such thing as aliens? So the argument from silence is a little dangerous. But at least three different ways Jesus did address it. And let's also remember from all the literature that we have, from all the information we have, there was no ambiguity about what Jews believed at that time. There was no sexual revolution taking place, okay? Homosexual practice was spoken against in very, very strong terms, even more strongly than within Scripture in some of the ancient Jewish literature. And there are even some references that may have existed in Jesus' day that says that one of the worst sins that the pagans ever committed was having men marry men and women marry women in ancient Jewish literature. And it may have been literature that Jesus knew about in his day. We know it came, it was written shortly after. It may have existed in his day, probably did. So there was no question, there was no ambiguity about it. But here are the three different ways that he addresses it. First, in Matthew chapter 5, he says he doesn't come to abolish the law of the prophets, but to fulfill. I understand the church here, you've had a major series going through the Sermon on the Mount. So what does he do? He takes the moral requirements of the scripture to a higher level. You've heard it said, don't commit adultery. I'm telling you, don't lust in your heart. You've heard it said, don't murder. I'm telling you, don't hate. So the moral requirements of the scripture, he takes to a higher level. So therefore, homosexual practice, the prohibition about that, he's not abolishing that. He's going to take that to a deeper level. Secondly, in Matthew 15, he explains that it's not what goes into your mouth that defiles you, but what comes out of your heart that defiles you. And he lists various sins, including sexual immoralities, plural, and adultery. The word we have in Greek for sexual immorality is porneia, from whence we get the word pornography. So he's talking about adultery, so that's sins that you commit while married, sexual sins, and then sexual immoralities, which is all other sexual acts outside of marriage. So he's talking about a guy sleeping with his girlfriend. He's talking about somebody raping another person. He's talking about two men having sex, two women having sex, all sexual relations outside of marriage as God-ordained marriage. So that's the second place he addresses it. And again, to a first century Jewish audience, he talks about sexual immorality in the plural. Of course, homosexual practice is in there. That's one of the most heinous at the top of the list in the ancient Jewish thought. Third, in Matthew 19, he's asked about divorce. And in his answer, he says, this is what God intended from the beginning, that a man leaves his father and mother and cleaves to his wife, and the two become one flesh. So there he tells you the meaning of marriage as God intended. A man joined to a woman, a woman joined to a man for life. There's also an important verse at the end of John chapter 2. And it tells us that he didn't put his trust in man, John 2, 24, 25. He didn't put his trust as man because he knew what was in man. He knew what was in human hearts. So he didn't need anyone to tell him about man. I debated a gay activist, and his basic point was that the biblical authors knew about sexual immorality among homosexuals. They knew about pederasty, about man-boy relationships. They knew about homosexual relationships in the context of temple worship and idolatry. But they didn't really know about loving, committed, monogamous same-sex relationships. Well, one argument against that is that there may well have been Jewish texts that talked about pagans, men marrying men and women marrying women in ancient days and how God judged that. Secondly, in the ancient Greco-Roman world, there are definitely examples of people in long-term committed same-sex relationships. And the ancient literature points to that. So that's not true anyway. But more importantly, Jesus knows what's inside people. Jesus can look into the hearts and minds of people. When he was on the earth, he would answer what people are thinking. So we would now have to believe that Jesus, who saw into the heart of every human being, somehow didn't understand homosexuality the way we understand it today. He didn't hear the heart cry and the desperation of someone saying, look, this is who I am, help me. It's actually an attack on who Jesus is. I read one response from a woman who claims to be a born-again Christian and, and fights for gay activist causes, and she said, that's right, Jesus didn't know. In other words, I would rather deny who Jesus is and twist scripture than deny what I feel. 
Very, very dangerous. Some say, look, Jesus reached out to people where they were. He hung out with the prostitutes, with the corrupt tax collectors. He hung out with people like that. And we ought to do the same. Oh, absolutely. We ought to reach out to sinners. But Jesus did not practice affirmational inclusion. In other words, he didn't reach out to people in their sin and say, go for it. Hey, ladies, let me give you a few tips to make some more money as prostitutes. Hey, guys, let me show you, you get a lot more money extorted from people if you, if you follow these techniques as a tax collector. No, no, he met people where they were, and he changed them. He met me right where I was as a sinful rebel and poured out his love on me. And it was a revelation of his love. I was deeply convicted about my badness. When I got a revelation of his goodness, I was instantly set free and said, I'll never put a needle in my arm again and was free from that night on. The power of the gospel. I am glad that he didn't affirm me in my sin. He does not practice affirmational inclusion, but transformational inclusion meets us where we are in his love and says, follow me. One pastor in England, same sex attracted, but living a holy life. All of us struggle with one issue or another. All of us have flaws that are fundamental to the core of our being that need redemption. All of us grow through all of our lives in Jesus. Here's a man who struggles with same sex attraction. It's not his identity. It's not who he is. You may say, I'm a gay Christian, but I'm celibate. God bless you. We're here to stand with you and to help you live a holy life and to be the friends that you need and the companions that you need and the prayer warriors that you need. We're here for you. But I'd encourage you not to use that terminology because it's giving yourself an identity that's not how God sees you. God sees you as his child, as his son, as his daughter, and we all have issues we struggle with. We all have things that we've had to overcome. We all have things that are, that are not pleasing in God's sight, that are fundamental to us, that need redemption and renewal. This pastor said that people, when they find out his background, they say, it must be so hard for you. He said, no, Jesus requires everything from all of us. And to all of us, he says, deny yourself and take up the cross. See, our big problem in America is we've come from a wrong gospel foundation. We start in America with this. This is who I am. This is how I feel. And God is here to please me. The biblical message is this is who God is. This is how God feels. And we are here to please him. <laughs> Fundamental difference in approach. This pastor also said, and Jesus is enough for all of us. I have friends who went from homosexuality to heterosexuality. They're happily married, and they're free. I have others that had a major change in their desires. They're married. They can still be tempted and struggle, but they're happily married. They live holy lives, and they say no to those temptations. And I know others who've not seen a change in their desires, but they say no to them, and they're all blessed. And they all say following Jesus is wonderful, and my life is full. All right, what about, what about Paul, and we'll end here. Romans 1 seems to be the most explicit statement in the entire Bible against homosexual practice. And it speaks about God's judgment on mankind, his wrath on mankind, and how we have sinned against him. And then he gave us over to our idolatry and then to sexual immorality and then perversions of sexual immorality and then all kinds of other sins. How do we get away from that if we're, if we're gay theologians, that, 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 that the women exchange natural relations for unnatural ones, the same way the men also abandon natural relations with women were inflamed with lust for one another? How do they get away from that? What they say is this. First, it's in the context of idol worship and promiscuity, and our relationship is committed, monogamous, and we love the Lord. Well, the problem is Paul says it's unnatural. It's contrary to nature. And, and the whole idol context is in the history of mankind, our rejection, our sin, and how he gives us over to these other sins. You say, no, 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 when Paul said unnatural, you're getting him wrong. This is what he really meant. This is what he really meant. He meant this. If I'm a heterosexual man, it is unnatural for me to have homosexual desires. 
when I got so inflamed with heterosexual lust, God judged me. He then turned me over to do what is contrary to nature. For me, that's homosexual relations. And that's what he's talking about. He's talking about heterosexual men engaging in homosexual practice. That is contrary to nature. That's unnatural. The problem with this is that that is absolutely not how Paul is using contrary to nature here. It's also interesting that for centuries and centuries before, people never came up with this interpretation until after the sexual revolution and the gay activist movement. That makes it suspect right there. But in Romans 1, Paul doesn't talk about men and women. In Greek, he talks about males and females. Why? Because he's going back to Genesis 1. Male and female, he created them. And when he talks about contrary to nature, he's talking about natural created order in Genesis 1, the way God created us. And there are several words that he uses in Romans 1 that come straight out of Genesis 1. Word after word, actually, to the point he's saying, this is contrary to God's created order. Look in the mirror. It's contrary to what he created and ordained, contrary to nature. And therefore, it is a serious perversion of what God established. And that's why there are even gay and lesbian scholars who say, no doubt about it, Paul condemned homosexual practice. In 1 Corinthians 6, 9 and 10, he gives a list of different sins and says, whoever practices this will not inherit the kingdom. And there are two words that are used there for homosexual practice. Side by side, there's no question, they speak of those who practice homosexuality. Not just abusive man-boy relationships, not just prostitution. Every major dictionary that has been compiled, even by scholars who barely believe the Bible, they agree, especially on one key word, that it speaks against homosexual practice. The good news is verse 11, Paul says, that's what some of you were. The good news is no matter who we are, no matter what we've done, no matter where we've fallen short, no matter what sins we've committed, the blood of Jesus has been shed. And God will receive you just as you are and give you a brand new life so that you can live the rest of your life the way he intended. What we need to do is encourage this. We need to encourage holiness more than heterosexuality, by which I mean this. If you're same-sex attracted, the goal is not for you to convince yourself that you like the opposite sex. You know, you're a guy. Find the prettiest girl in the church who's single and date her, and that will cure you of your homosexuality. If it was that easy, everybody would be, quote, cured. No, that can be very frustrating. That, that can show a lack of understanding. In fact, when you say, well, I love the sin or I hate the sin, a gay person hears you say, you hate me. Because they say, that's who I am. What we need to do is encourage people to live a holy life to encourage people by the power of the Holy Spirit to lead a holy life. And out of that holy life, as they lead a holy and new life, God will work in every area of their lives, and many will even begin to find resolution of their attractions and desires and changes in that regard as well. The good news is for every single human being, there is new life in Jesus, there's forgiveness of sins. The bad news is for the flesh, everybody has to repent Everybody has to say, God, save me to the core of my being, but that's the most wonderful thing that could ever happen. Now, we, we've covered a good amount of ground and obviously could only go so deep. The book that I've written that's the most relevant, I really encourage you to get a copy for yourself. It's also written for those struggling with same-sex attraction or those questioning what we're saying. Can you be gay and Christian? Uh, it will break your heart as you read it because I will take you in to the lives of those who identify as gay Christians. You'll hear their arguments. You'll hear their hearts. And we lay out the scriptures. Every scriptural truth we reference, we get into, but in even greater depth, far greater in this book. It's readable. It's clear. Uh, a book that I spent almost six years working on, on and off, uh, talks about what's happening in society, gay activism. The word that God spoke to me over 10 years ago was reach out and resist. Reach out to the people with compassion. Resist the agenda with courage. Um, no major publisher would touch this book. I've had three publishers apologize to me since. Um, it's called The Queer Thing Happened to America. Uh, it's uh, almost 700 pages, 1,500 endnotes. It is critically important reading. And you say it's a lot to read. Pull out any chapter that interests you. Pull out the chapter on the media, on the schools, on the court cases. It is massively relevant. And then later this year, uh, in the summer, we should have a book out called Outlasting the Gay Revolution 
where we will infuse you with hope and courage and eight long-term principles for positive cultural change. So that'll be out later. So the books are there. I also have some DVD lectures, a, a debate with a gay activist about these things on the book table. So take advantage of the resources there. We've got others that'll tie in with the messages tomorrow. And then connect with me online. We are super active in social media and other ways, and I strongly encourage you to connect with us online. My Facebook page is Ask Dr. Brown, A-S-K-D-R Brown. Through the day and night, edifying graphics, quotes, posts, links to articles, uh, everything there, day and night. And to connect all the different ways, my website, askdrbrown.org, A-S-K-D-R-Brown.org. And you can connect with us there, email, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube. All right, you can sign up there. Uh, and then, like I said, thousands of hours of free resources. And then lastly, at the book table, you'll see these envelopes. I want to be a monthly torchbearer. We're stretched out. We're involved in Jewish evangelism day and night, cultural issues day and night, raising up missionaries to send out to the world. You read about what's happening with ISIS in the Middle East right now. We have grads serving right in those very areas. I mean, right in the thick of it. One of our grads was killed by, by Islamic terrorists three years ago. I mean, that, that's where our folks are serving. We're raising them up, sending them out day and night. So if you can, if you can become a monthly torchbearer, grab one of these envelopes, fill it out, and join our support team.